and um, welcome to today's session um, of Open Texas 2022. I am Whitney Johnson Freeman with the Open Texas Conference Committee and will be emceeing this session. Um, thank you all for joining us today for Visible and Invisible Labor, Building a Sustainable OER Program. And I'll hand it off to the presenters. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ariana Santiago and I'm the OER coordinator at the University, University of Houston Libraries. And I'm Carrie Creelman, Associate Dean for Collection Strategies and Discovery at the University of Houston Libraries. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Whitney, for moderating and thank you to our closed captioner. Uh, we are here this morning to talk about building a sustainable OER program at a large state institution that supports more than 47,000 students. We will uh, talk today about how our program has evolved and use that framework to consider advocacy strategies that recognize and value the significant labor needs to support a sustainable, scalable OER program. So before we dive in to us doing a lot of talking, we would like to ask you to reflect individually on how you have advocated for resources to advance OER initiatives in the past. Do you have strategies that have worked, lessons learned? Take a couple of minutes and I will start my timer. Uh, take a couple of minutes to jot down a couple of notes and then we'll reconvene. Feel free to share things in the chat and uh, I'm gonna start my two minute timer now. Got a 30 second warning. So we're coming up on two minutes in about 20 more seconds. All right, I will ask us to reconvene. Uh, we really wanted to start with a reflection to get you thinking about your local context and what you have done, where you're starting from. Um, if anyone would like to share uh, advocacy strategies that they have used that worked or lessons learned in the chat, uh, or we can, if anyone would like to unmute and share something uh, verbally, we're happy to, to let you do that as well. I see adding an OER page on the library's website and informing patrons about various repositories listed there in the chat. I don't see or hear anyone unmuting. Um, so do please continue to populate the chat as we go through this. Um, some of the things that 
Ariana, or sorry, Ariana, uh, Ariana and I were thinking about in preparing this presentation uh, came from our our early days uh, where we were surveying um, our students about how much they were spending on textbooks. Uh, we were looking at textbook costs through the bookstore. Um, we investigated programs at other institutions by a lot of website sleuthing and, and several interviews with folks. Um, talking about different ways, different stakeholder groups to uh, advocate to, including university and library administrators, leveraging student groups. Uh, I see a few more things in the chat, like including OER and the information literacy presentations. Absolutely. Uh, Kenneth says that he worked with his dean to design an affordable textbooks program that included OER, adoption, adaption, and creation as a preferred solution. Awesome. Liz says uh, investigated and eventually approved for press books subscription. Absolutely, we use that as well. Um, marking OER courses in the catalog. That's a great way to do it. Yeah, participating in an OER faculty boot camp. Love it. Absolutely. Um, collaborating with the Ac Academy for Teaching and Learning to provide faculty professional development sessions on OER. Fantastic. We've done some of those as well. Love it. Feel free to keep throwing things into the chat um, and keep those strategies in mind as we go into our presentation. I will start talking a little bit now about um, our program and how we got started. So uh, our program got started in 2017 because of the advocacy of our student government association. Textbook affordability was a key issue for that SGA administration who advocated directly to the provost about the issue and about OER. Um, incidentally, she went on to work for Spark, uh, so we're very proud of her. Um, and this was clearly a, a passion area for her. Um, our provost at the time was a huge student success champion and tasked the libraries with implementing a pilot program to educate faculty about OER options and pilot a program that would benefit students. The provost provided some initial funding for us to join the uh, Open Textbook Network at the time, now the Open Education Network, and for them to host a workshop for our faculty, as well as to provide some incentives for faculty to adopt OER in replacement of commercial textbooks. The library's dean at the time chaired that committee of uh, invested faculty and two additional librarians, of which I was one. Uh, in addition to hosting the workshop, uh, our pilot program committee developed our initial incentive program to encourage faculty to adopt, adapt, or create OER and use library materials, sorry, or use library materials in lieu of commercial textbooks. And I should point out that um, from the provost and the SGA perspective, the, the mission was not solely OER, but was saving students money and ensuring that they were ready to be actively engaged in their class work uh, from day one. And so where that meant library materials in lieu of textbooks, uh, we were good with that. Uh, so we, we researched other incentive programs, we developed criteria and program logistics, promoted the program, reviewed applications, and selected award recipients. We learned a lot about OER in the process uh, and listing it off like that in just one short little sentence makes it sound like it wasn't a whole lot of work, uh, but I'm sure you all know that launching a program from scratch when you don't have much knowledge of the topic and you're trying to work by committee when everyone else already has a full-time job is a lot of work. Um, a lot of work, capitals, underline, bold, italics, right? Um, the other non-dean librarian and I, who were both new department heads at the time, we estimated that we were each putting in about 10 hours a week for most of the 2017, 2018 academic year to get this off the ground. So uh, it was clear to the Dean of the libraries that this would continue to be a provost priority, uh, but that funding would be coming from the library's budget and program administration was under the library's purview. So this very quickly became a funding, sorry, a fundraising priority for our Dean. Um, our early faculty response was positive. Our early adopters didn't need to be convinced about the benefits of OER, 
they and their students were ready. Uh, we had a lot of initial interest, um, found that what they did need more than anything was support, how to find materials, copyright questions, et cetera. Uh, so while the pilot program by committee was interesting and helpful for faculty buy-in, it wasn't practical for long-term program sustainability and certainly not for growth. So my library colleague and I began advocating early in the process for a dedicated librarian position to manage and grow our fledgling OER program. Our early strategies were not particularly sophisticated or nuanced. Uh, it was more of a desperate plea to the Dean and leadership team for a lifesaver while we were drowning in work. We had also both implemented departmental restructures as we took on our roles. And this was the post Hurricane Harvey school year. So there was a lot going on um, in addition to getting the OER program up and running. Uh, thankfully, we had the ready support of our library's administration and the funding and the promise of making this a fundraising priority uh, to hire an OER coordinator that would be positioned in my department at the time uh, to help with onboarding and program transition. So our coordinator, Ariana, came on board just in time to help us implement the initial incentive award program and support awardees, which she'll talk a little bit about, uh, about shortly. But um, a, a final note about our, our program launch. Having some faculty, the Dean and two department heads trying to launch this program was incredibly helpful in realizing what we didn't know and recognizing where we needed help. This led to a lot of easy advocacy for the position because there were folks, <coughs> there, there, sorry, some of the decision-making folks like the Dean were directly involved and could see the amount of work happening. Um, but it also meant that there was a lot of recognition for the need for professional development. We figured out what we didn't know and it was a lot. Uh, so when Ariana came into the role, she had a great background in teaching and learning, but she didn't know very much about OER. And we ensured we had uh, professional development funds for a variety of programs for her. Uh, so before she talks a little bit more about that, <clears throat> uh, we do want to focus on um, the significant labor involved in managing an OER program. So we've previously asked you to think a little bit about what you've done to advocate. Now we would like to ask you to think about what activities or responsibilities are involved in supporting OER adoption and use. So again, please take two minutes to make some notes. Feel free to throw some things into the chat box uh, and I will once again, start my timer. Thirty second warning before we reconvene.
All right. I know two minutes goes by very quickly, but I'm going to bring us back. Um, please continue to post things in the chat or make some notes. Uh, hopefully we're, we're sharing some good ideas and you'll see some, some helpful strategies uh, show up here. So, so far I'm seeing, oh, Mildred, hi. Um, <clears throat> so far seeing keeping resources up to date, quality and uh, relevance of the OER. Absolutely. Collaborations with other departments, definitely. It's a great way to get buy-in. Um, Kate, hi. Kate's our new OER librarian. Um, good to see you, Kate. Uh, assisting faculty with locating and evaluating OER for adoption, adaption, et cetera. How to use open licenses. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Uh, and that, that can be very time consuming. Um, an OER committee to strengthen OER adoption and use at NAU. Great outreach to make instructors aware of OER, absolutely. Sustaining and cultivating interest in OER, planning professional development events. All of this takes so much time, doesn't it? Um, all right, I'll keep letting y'all post some things into the chat. Does anyone wanna unmute and share an experience? I'm gonna count to 15 in my head. Not seeing anybody, so please again continue to post into the chat. Um, we wanted to to put these reflection opportunities early in the presentation to really give you an opportunity to think about what you're doing um, and to reflect on the labor needed to sustain OER initiatives and the impact uh, of capacity limitations for your program um, and how you tell that story. So we're gonna. I'm going to turn it over to Ariana to talk a little bit more about uh, how our program evolved once we got it off the ground and she came on board. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Um, so as Carrie mentioned a few minutes ago, when I started in the OER coordinator position in 2018, I didn't have any previous experience working with OER and I was really essentially brand new to it. Uh, but at that point, the OER committee had done a great deal of research and planning, and they launched our alternative textbook incentive program. That's what our um, incentive program is called. Um, so I was stepping into a, an OER program where a cohort of faculty had been awarded through that incentive program, and they were ready to be supported in their use of OER. But I definitely felt like I had some catching up to do before I could adequately support them. So the first significant investment of labor was in training and professional development so that I could develop my own expertise. Now, professional development related to OER can span a lot of different areas, um, as we saw that supporting OER involves a lot of different activities and responsibilities. Um, so I started with trainings on copyright and open licensing, as well as opportunities to gain an overview of OER and make connections within the open community. In a period of about four months, when I first started in this position, I completed the Coursera Copyright for Educators and Librarians course, the Creative Commons Certificate, and the Library Juice Academy Introduction to OER course. With all of this together, it was sort of a customized crash course in OER that I was able to apply in real time as I was learning on the job. I think there are a lot of similar stories out there where someone takes on an OER role or gets it added to their responsibilities, and um, they'll need that dedicated time and training to get up to speed. And as you can see, that alone takes time, energy, and resources. And as I'm building OER expertise for myself, it's also important to consider how that expertise is shared, for example, within the library and with instructors and other campus units. So I encourage uh, library colleagues to share with me any questions they have about OER, whether that's their own questions or those that they've um, received from their faculty. And I've often invited subject liaisons um, to be part of OER consultations that I have with faculty as well. To extend OER knowledge more broadly across campus, I've 
given presentations to introduce people to the idea of OER. I've hosted drop-in consultation hours to meet instructors at a place that's convenient for them and tried a variety of ways to bring people together in conversation, like discussion groups and group viewings of webinars. So these are all ways to build a shared understanding around OER, which requires constantly checking in to gauge what resonates at your institution, what are the common questions and barriers for people, as well as just what are the effective ways to engage with people. An important question to consider in all of this is how do you connect this necessary training in OER to advocacy and assessment? So with the scope of OER and the scope of many OER programs that support that can support a wide range of activities, as we saw in the last um, brainstorming question, uh, resources are needed to maintain and continually develop expertise to support the services that we provide. And how do you articulate and demonstrate that when you're advocating for resources? So often, I think we focus on assessing the outputs of things like the number of consultations and number of instruction sessions, number of courses that adopt OER and the amount of money that's saved for students, which are all important. But assessing the efforts that make those things possible could play into the ability to advocate for them. So what that looks like for me is that I'm constantly assessing what works and what doesn't when I'm, gauging, when I'm engaging in outreach and professional development across campus. So I mentioned those several different ways of engaging um, with campus, like presentations, discussion groups, all of those different kinds of things that I've tried. And those efforts shift for me when I realize that something isn't resonating or isn't reaching the audience in the way that I intended. Additionally, when I've been involved in speaking to potential donors, Part of what I talk about is the time and labor that goes into outreach and developing an understanding of OER for the people that we hope will adopt. Having assessed these efforts and re refined them accordingly, we now have some documentation to use to advocate for additional human resources. We know how much time goes into things like developing expertise through professional development, hosting outreach events, and doing the research involved in faculty consultations. And this speaks to the impact of these activities and what it would take for them to be sustainable rather than a pilot. As I learned about OER and gained more confidence in the role, in the role I began to see our library's OER program as being, a, being made up of three overlapping components. The incentive program, the services we provide to support OER, and a community of practice. Now, all of these components didn't end up being as fleshed out or as robust as I initially imagined because these things take time and this work is all still in progress. Though I think this conceptualization or this image that you see here illustrates the scope of the work and the labor involved in truly supporting OER. Many institutions have incentive or grant programs which need to be developed, managed, and maintained. OER services, which could include a wide range of things, may or may not be limited to those faculty awarded in a grant or incentive program, and those services require time and expertise to be able to provide. And a community of practice needs to be nurtured to thrive. I found that I constantly had to balance the one-on-one -on -one and direct support that I provide instructors in adopting, adapting, and creating OER with the bigger picture program planning aspects. And many people doing OER work are asked or expected to do all of that in a half-time OER position or by committee. Okay, so um, thinking about how the different ways in which OER programs are staffed and supported, uh, and what it might look like to advocate for people, additional people to support your program. Let's quickly reflect on what assessment data and documentation you collect and can use for that purpose. So again, I'm going to start my timer and give you two minutes. Please feel free to throw something into the chat at any point.
Going to give you your 30 second warning now. Already seeing some great ideas in the chat, measuring student savings on textbook costs. Absolutely, that's a big one to demonstrate impact. Getting that feedback from your stakeholders, all of them, students, faculty, administrators, course completion rates, absolutely for you know comparing OER classes to traditional textbooks. That gets to that readiness for day one and student success argument, absolutely. We're gonna let you all keep uh, posting some things in the chat while Ariana continues the presentation. Okay, so continuing on with our story of our program, in the first few years, we experienced a significant amount of growth. The alternative textbook incentive program was and still is a driving force motivating instructors to replace required commercial textbooks with OER or library resources. We're currently in our fourth round of running the incentive program, and on average, 19 projects are awarded in each round. That's a total of at least 76 courses and even more faculty or instructors who have newly adopted OER or other free resources as required course materials since 2018. As adoptions increase, so does the need to support those adoptions. So there's a range in the level of support that's needed. Some um, instructors seem pretty good to go on their own with minimal support, while others need um, a little more hands-on um, collaboration and support as they're adopting OER. Um, so this usually takes the form of one-on-one -on -one or small group consultations covering topics like copyright, open licensing, finding OER, approaches to creating OER, and more. OER creation and publishing is an area of growth as I continually found that our instructors had an interest in creating their own customized learning materials or significantly adapting existing OER. And while UH Libraries is not a publisher and does not provide formal publishing services, I investigated how we could still support instructors in OER creation. And this, of course, involved additional professional development to learn about this area, and we ended up providing Pressbooks as a platform for OER publishing. And I developed relationships and collaborations with campus partners, such as the bookstore, instructional designers, and faculty engagement and development, who all play a role in supporting OER. So it looks like things are going pretty well, and they are, uh, but the reality is also that that's a really full plate and the workload didn't leave much room for anything else like working towards strategic and long-term goals. So these are some of the goals that we had for future directions, but didn't have the capacity to achieve. Targeting high impact adoptions. Our incentive program is a successful motivator, but our approach so far is to promote it to a general audience and see who comes in. And we'd love to get more strategic about the faculty, courses, and programs we reach out to for potential OER adoption. Additional uh, OER training for faculty. So I give presentations and workshops when the opportunities come up, but this kind of support could be offered more regularly um, and could be more intentional about sharing OER expertise across campus better support for creation. We definitely have capacity limitations here and services the libraries cannot provide for publishing, but at the same time, it's important to ensure that faculty are well supported in being able to create high quality and accessible OER material. And we continue to investigate how to do this and make iterative improvements over time. We have a widespread community of instructors who are using OER, but it's not a well-defined community of practice. Community is such an integral aspect of OER, so it would be ideal to create and facilitate more opportunities for a community of practice to come together. Through a constant evaluation of our capacity, we realized that something needed to change. We either needed additional resources to continue reaching the institutional goals around OER, or we had to slow down or stop doing some things to keep the workload reasonable, which would mean a significant shift from the vision to make OER part of the institutional culture.
So we made a plan to advocate for additional resources, starting by outlining the program goals and program needs. The focus here was on articulating our goals and the resources needed to reach those goals and contrasting that with what we can do with the current level of resources, including what we would need to scale back on or stop doing. This was also broken down into what we could do with different levels of staffing. For example, what we could do with the existing OER coordinator position, what we could do with a graduate assistant, with an additional OER librarian position, or with two additional OER librarian positions. We took this proposal to the Dean of Libraries to advocate for additional resources to support OER. And that conversation was pretty effective in communicating the capacity limitations, and we gained support around the idea of hiring additional staff for OER. This took place in late 2019. So of course, shortly thereafter, the COVID pandemic hit, which led to a hiring freeze. And around the same time, our Dean left for another institution. So we were in a, also in a leadership transition all of which put a pause on things. But in the meantime, pre-COVID and before our Dean left, she had made OER one of her fundraising priorities. This brought in some funds for the OER program, which also factored into our conversations about capacity and resources. Funding is crucial to the sustainability of OER, but there are challenges related to it as well, because in order to spend funds, you need staff and additional fund funding leads to program growth, and that growth was challenging due to limited capacity. So here we have one last uh, reflection or discussion question for you. So we'd like you to take a minute or so to think about um, an action you can take to advance the impact and sustainability of OER efforts. This could be something big, it could be something small, something that you could take away from this to work towards uh, advancing impact and sustainability of OER at your institution. So we'll give you a minute to think about that. And we might cut this one, we might not have as much time on this one, I'm just realizing what time it is, but we'll give you a little bit to think about that and add any thoughts you have in the chat. Think in the interest of time, I'm going to move us forward and, and let y'all throw some things in the chat there. Um, a couple of concluding points. Right? Um, I'm sure you know context is critical to successful advocacy. Can't emphasize that enough. Um, in our introductory slides, I was mentioning our dean and provost at the time. Right, Of course, higher ed changed with COVID. Our local context changed at the same time. We had a, a, our dean left at the beginning of COVID. We had an interim dean. A new library dean started February 2021. A year later, our provost announced her retirement. So our biggest champions were gone, and we have uh, new or interim leaders in place. Uh, we've also pursued an inclusive access program. Uh, the university has. Uh, in the last couple of years. So that changes the local conversation around um, affordable textbooks and learning at the institution. So Ariana spent a lot of time through peak pandemic times, uh, in addition to, to flipping all of our content and support uh, to virtual, she spent a lot of time um, evaluating the program and where we were going with it and thinking about what we learned in the first few years. And that time reflection and evaluation enabled her to refine, refine our strategies for growth and revise our advocacy strategy in light of what had changed within higher ed and our local situation. And this set us up to advocate when we had a new dean. Um, so our concluding slide here, uh, where are we now? We were able to hire a graduate student. She started about six months ago, and the libraries continued to prioritize and move forward with that new OER librarian position that we thought we were going to hire back in 2019. She just started last month. Um, so this has been a really busy year for onboarding new personnel and planning to implement our growth plans, our growth goals, rather, um, based on the expertise of the people that we've onboarded. So we have secured some additional funding. 
And we have plans to spend that funding to implement our growth goals over the next few years. And continual evaluation of our program has been important since the very beginning. That's how we uh, are continuing our practice, evaluating our growth, priorities, future directions, all within our changing campus context. Um, as we do this, we're taking our lessons learned about storytelling and advocacy and applying them as we move forward. Right? This is essential to ensuring personnel support as well as advocating for future funding from the university and our donors. Uh, throughout this process, we try to keep in sight what is reasonable to accomplish with our current staffing levels, uh, recognizing the labor, both visible and that which we strive to make more visible, that's necessary to do the work that we have outlined. Scalable, sustainable program growth based on our existing staffing and university priorities. That's our refrain for the program, and that's what we based our program growth around. So we'll conclude there. Um, we have a few minutes for Q&A. Thank you very much for your participation and attendance today. We're happy to answer whatever questions you have. Unless everybody's just ready for lunch. <laughs> Will Hill is asking a question about whether we can save the chat session. And um, there are some great ideas here. Agreed. Um, do we have the option to, to download the chat? I, I do not know this. Um, the I think we do as co hosts. Recorded. Yeah. Um, I just saved the chat right now. Hopefully I'll be able to access it again and we can post that with our session. Um, yes, looks like that is saved on my desktop. So assuming that worked out, we will be able to um, upload that. Having an OER coordinator is absolutely fantastic, yes. Whitney, I don't know how we wrap this up if we. Uh... Um, we have until noon, so we are oh, we welcome okay. to, to keep it open. Um, but we can stop recording if you would prefer to let everybody bring things up naturally. We could probably go ahead and wrap it up and stop the recording. I know I can stick around for a few extra minutes if anyone has questions. So before I do that, I want to thank everybody um, for attending and thank you, Carrie and Ariana um, or Ariana um, for presenting this.